What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Time for another episode of Wednesday Afternoon Worship. Jesus, didn't think we'd do one of these. It's been a long, uh, hung time, but you know, with Lost Omens, the Mwangi Expanse out and all the sweet content that's in there, I had to stick my proverbial knife into it and dig in. Today, not one, not two, not three, four deities. Today, Walkina and the old gods of the Threefold Sun. Let's hit it. Okay, so as it really is with like all of this book, there's a lot to unpack here. Definitely not used to seeing this many hundreds of pages for our campaign settings. So before I tell you what they do mechanically, we've got to have a bit of a history lesson. A very, very long time ago, if we're pointing at the current year 4721, oh, 5,029 years ago, a line of kings and queens who proclaimed themselves to be directly descended from Chohar founded the city of Imzali. As warrior kings and warrior queens are wont to do, they quickly conquered the surrounding area in which they lived and then subjugated everybody. And then when there was nobody left to subjugate in their immediate area, they turned to, of all things, blood sport. We're talking children from outlying villages to participate in their games. We're talking tribute for the winners. We're talking tribute to make the city look prettier so that people would want to come to these games, which is all well and good and all well and not good at all, until eventually a network of local officials got real tired of this and decided to overthrow the government. Fortunately, in the 800 odd years that the government had been in power, the army had turned into a little more than like local blood sport team. So it wasn't a very hard thing for the newly minted council of Mwangisa to get the government out. Now, the thing about Mzali is Mzali like to mummify their rulers, call upon the spirits of those long past to defend the city and such. So as one might expect, the council went systematically from tomb to tomb to tomb, getting rid of potential threats. Unfortunately for them, a young prince by the name of Wolkina had been given in haste the sepulchre meant for a famous gladiator when he died of illness, so his tomb was missed for a very, very long time. Flash forward down the line, eventually the Council of Mwangisa rediscovers Walkina's mummy along with all of the grave goods in which he was interred. After this, several counselors had visions of, quote, Mzali's ancient solar disk symbol rising in place of the sun and heard whispers that Mzali would soon rise again with their help. They interpreted this as the state itself would rise in power. They thus put the mummified kid on display and attracted folks from all across the expanse to witness their glory days. Days when there weren't Sargovan colonists right on the border, pirates running all up and down the coast protecting the colonists from their enemies while also fortifying their position, raiders from Blood Cove, so on and so forth. As such, they bring tributes of gold and gems and trade goods and everything in between all piled up into one place. Yeah, no, as you might expect, Sargovan leaders sent an expedition of mercenaries and pirates to go plunder that about a hundred years ago. Unfortunately for them, Walkina's mummy returned in on life and essentially nuked the hell out of the entire invading army. Once Walkina, the newly minted undead deity, yeah, that's a thing, realized what had happened to his homeland, he swore to rid the Expanse of outside invaders. Everyone who supported that theory in the Expanse at the time flocked to his banner. The Council of Mwangisa was sidelined and present day, Imzali is a city on the precipice of war, a divine theocracy led by a literal deity whose rule is law. If you're an outsider, if you question him, if you venerate the old sun gods, who, by the way, Walkina's priests have done a very good job of purging Imzali of, with the exception of one example, then you are the enemy. Walkina is opposed by the Bright Lions, a faction within Imzali and beyond who venerate those same gods under which Imzali was founded. They seek to overthrow the tyrant, the city lives in a state of perpetual cold war, and we're literally fighting literal, not like what's going on in Iblidos, not mythic folks with the ability to pass out stuff, not demon lords, no, a literal god. Yeah, this is new territory. Who are these gods, you ask? Well, I'll tell you. Tlehar, Chohar, 
and Luhar are the threefold gods that represent the sun in Mwangi culture. Tsuehar, the rising sun, the goddess that keeps watch over new beginnings, birth, coming to terms with new gender, new sexuality, folks fleeing unsafe homes to go to new ones, the sanctuary of peace which morning brings. Chohar, the sun that shines down on folks who cannot protect themselves until they find the renewed sense of strength to fight for justice, teaching that it's one's duty to fight for the innocent, to fight for the powerless, to never, like, keep power for yourself, and Luhar, the goddess of dusk, the eternal sleep, the vigil that stands in the night, the goddess of sleep that is so necessary for one to rest, recharge, revitalize. A deity that teaches death is nothing except for that final big sleep. Now let's talk about these guys mechanically, shall we? Starting with Volcana, starting with the one that's walking around that exists. You thought it was scary when we had definitely not Scientologists up north. You thought it was scary when the wizards were fighting. Nope, nope, this is worse. The God King's alignment is lawful evil. His divine followers may be a lawful neutral or a lawful evil. His divine font is to harm. His divine skill is deception. His divine ability goes to strength or wisdom. His domains are family, freedom, sun, and tyranny with the alternate domains duty and fire. Clerics receive Burning Hands as a first level spell, Fireball as a third level spell, and Wall of Fire as a fourth level spell. I am sensing a theme. Walkina's edicts are uphold Mzali's laws, tend to Walkina and obey his instructions. Yeah, that's that's pretty lawful evil. And oppose exploitation of the Mwangi expanse. Anathema to him is to consort or trade with non-Mwangi peoples, as well as defy orders of the guy who's giving you the spells. His favorite weapon is the spear. On the other side of the conflict, Tlehar is neutral good. Her divine followers may be lawful good, neutral good, or chaotic good. Her divine font is to heal. Her divine ability goes to enter Cha. Her divine skill is crafting. Her domains are cities, healing, passion, and sun, with the alt domains of chains, creation, vigil, and zeal. Clerics may prepare Soothe as a first level spell, Enthrall as a third level spell, and Dreaming Potential as a fifth level spell. For her edicts, one must give themselves fully to everything they attempt, always maintain hope that tomorrow will be a better day, treasure every gift you are given by those who matter to you. Anathema to her is to lose your motivation to your regrets, which is wordy. I suppose what that means is lose motivation and then get sad that you've lost it. If you lose motivation and give something up freely, cool. Spread despair or treat a loved one poorly. Her favorite weapon is the Morning Star. High Noon Chohar is lawful good. His divine followers may be L, G, L, N, or N, G. His divine font also to heal. His divine ability to strength or charisma. His divine skill is intimidation. His domains are fire, family, cities, and sun with the alt domains duty, toil, vigil, and zeal. His clerics may prepare burning hands at first level, fireball at third level, and fire shield as opposed to wall of fire at fourth level. His edicts finish any and all tasks you accept, bring those who are cruel to justice, show pride in your home and your heritage. Anathema to him is to break your word, be cruel to the innocent, or to rebuke someone due to their homeland. And his favorite weapon is the Star Knife. Lastly, Luhar is Lawful Neutral. She allows Lawful Good, Lawful Neutral, and Lawful Evil Divine Worshippers. Her divine font is to harm. Odd, given how much she opposes undeath, but alright. The divine ability goes to Dex or Wiz. Her divine skill is Stealth. Her domains are Cities, Darkness, Dreams, and Sun, with the alt domains Fate, Soul Star, and Zeal. Her clerics may prepare Sleep as a first level spell, you knew you'd see it. Invisibility Sphere is a third level spell, and Shadow Walk as a fifth level spell. For her edicts, Luhar demands followers learn about the night and prepare to face its creatures and dangers. Always make time for sleeping and dreams, get those eight hours, kids, and ensure others never go to sleep scared. Pretty real given the things that exist within Pathfinder at large that you might be afraid of showing up under your bed and eating you for breakfast. Anathema to her is to stay up all night without any breaks for sleeping or dreaming. Attack a person or creature while they sleep, leave a badly wounded opponent alive and suffering, create undead or ask questions of the dead, don't disturb the sleeping, of course. Her favorite weapon, the spiked chain. Now, again, there's so much going on here. It's 
hard to know where to begin. That's that's legitimately why I wanted to take so much time with this book because there's so much in it. I first think the concept of the triune deity representing the sun paves its way for non-traditional clerics. Lawful good is in alignment all three of these deities allow, thus I could very easily see a cleric who worshiped all three. Matter of fact, I'm kind of surprised we don't see rules for that like we do for other pantheons within this book. The rituals write themselves. It's a morning, it's a new day, embrace the new, be happy, go forth, do the things you want to do. By noon, make sure you're committing to the tasks that you've accepted and you're working very hard at them. By night, get good rest so you can do it all over again. On the other side of that coin, not only does Walkino represent something that's very real in the setting, chelish colonization of the Mwangi Expanse, exploitation of resources, and how one might want those people to GTFO your lands, contrasting with Chohar in a very interesting way. Two sides of the very same coin here. On one hand, Chohar would have us not rebuke people just because they're from somewhere else, but do it because they're horrible, while Kina would just as soon burn them all to the ground. I know what's best for us, don't defy me. I think it's super relevant to point out that Walkina does not allow neutral evil worshippers. Also, again, literal deity level creature walking around the surface of Galarian, who also has a faction that actively opposes him. The adventure path that I hope we see eventually writes itself. You're literally going up against someone who has the power to snap their fingers and make you go away. We're ignoring the fact that most higher than your level creatures could also do this, but you get what I mean. These four deities also seem to paint their home state in a very like solar cycle kind of matter. At the beginning of the story, the risen sun and their warriors go conquer the place found the state. The sun sets with the council of Monyisa overthrowing the power. The sun rises again and burns a bunch of colonizers only to set as the tyrannical rule sets into the state. Do we see the rise of the old sun gods once again in the bright lions? Only time will tell. Till then, that's all the time I have for this one. It's been a long time since I did a Wednesday afternoon worship. That was fun. What do y'all think? Are we worshiping these deities? Are we bringing them to your games? How were we liking this book? Let me know down in the comments. Paizo, thank you once again for getting me this book early because my God, there's so much to process. But till then, we'll see you next time.